as I was praying last night, I felt the need to speak something. And this morning as I was praying, I felt the same need to speak the same thing. I talked to the Lord about when, because I, I got the idea clearly that it should be sometime today. And I, well, Lord, I can't do it today because I've got to teach, you know, and all this sort of thing. Otherwise, I'm working. And it's like I hear this little voice, you idiot. You're going to be on Facebook Live tonight. That's why I can't sleep. But so, um, you know, because I was going to do it on Facebook Live. But uh, so it's 9-11. So I thought I'd talk about from 9-11, 19 years ago until now. What, you know, what has happened? What does it all mean? How does it compare with biblical history and so on and so forth? A little bit of American history, just to make sure we know that why this is founded as a Judeo, not a Christian nation, but a Judeo-Christian nation. And we all know that there are already people here in 1492. Some of those folks are doing their DNA work and finding out that it goes back to this place called Jerusalem. Even then, even before 1492. When they sailed the ocean blue. When they sailed the ocean blue, that was on Tisha B'Av yep. in 1492, the day that the Spanish Inquisition officially got kicked off. It got kicked off prior to that in March, but not in an official way. There were some 300, uh, doggone, I never can remember what these folks are commonly called, but they're, you know, it's an organization that's been around for many centuries. Anyway, killed, I can't remember however many of them, in March the 13th, it was on a Friday. That's where we get Friday the 13th from. But it officially got kicked off on Tisha B'Av that particular July. And three shiploads chock full of Spanish Jews came to America, or what was not America at that time. Then at the turn of the century, just into the 1500s, some folks came because of Inquisition reaching the uh, new you know, New Holland, New Netherlands area. Folks from Amsterdam came with their rabbi to what is now called New York. They called it New Amsterdam. They called it Territory uh, New Netherlands. So you have basically a time period when this big piece of land was seen as, and you can read this in some history books, there's a history, there's a book that took 40 years to write, I'm going to retrieve it because I, I loaned it out and I've learned my lesson about loaning things out, when you loan it out that's called giving it away. But um, I, I do have your hiding place book, I'm still reading it. Well, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I trust you. But yeah, this was for folks that you know I knew for about three days and that sort of thing, but anyway. <laughs> Dumb me, but it's called Pirate Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, and it talks about you know how this country was seen as Israel, was seen as a new Israel by folks who were coming here because of the Inquisition, because all of them were Jews. And then came England. Uh, you'll talk to folks. Oh, yeah, England came here. Yeah, that was after. That was after. That's why this nation came to be. You know, you you'll read about. Uh, Franklin being the guy that, you know, introduced the idea of Hebrew being the national language. And it received some debate. It wasn't just shrugged off right away. It actually received some debate. There is There were a whole lot more people keeping the Sabbath at that time. You know, all kinds of stuff, you know, that's made this country specifically a Judeo-Christian nation. And what I mourn greatly right now is we're seeing it go completely away from even a Christian nation, let alone a Judeo-Christian nation. But we're going to talk about that. Why did 9-11 happen? Why did blood moons happen five years ago? And so on and so forth. So let me give you a little bit of history about Israel and the what we otherwise know as a Babylonian exile. Just rather quickly, I took these notes, did these notes on the way here tonight. So it's going to be... And then finish them up over there? Finish yeah. them up over there a little <laughs> bit ago, yes. So it's, you know, this goes back to the days when not long after we moved here, back then when I was doing many of my sermons, this is more sermon material than Bible study. Oops, that's mm -hmm. revealing the sermon. Well, anyway, 
Um, that was when sermon, I would be writing sermons down on my way to, you know, either the brick building or before that to um, Springdale. But so it's going to be short, but you, I ask that you go ahead and share your thoughts. I enjoy that. I learn from it. And I like your ideas. So Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar um, came to power in Babel in Babylon in 605 BC. He struck Israel, particularly Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in that same year. That was the first strike on Jerusalem from Nebuchadnezzar was in 605 when he came to power. He first went against Egypt, but then he, right after that, went against Jerusalem. 605 BC, in 587 BC, that same king of Babel came to Jerusalem and looted. He stole much of its wealth. He came after its wealth. By the way, that's why they were not all pirates back in the pirating days were Jewish, but some of them were because they were after the wealth that was stolen at the start of the Inquisition from their homes and by the governments for whatever it's worth. They weren't trying to be mean. They just wanted to hunt down the government people that stole their property. Much of the same was going on here in 587 BC from a fellow named Nebuchadnezzar who sent people. In 586 BC, as it says in Jeremiah, quote, in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he destroyed the temple as well as the city of Jerusalem. As we all know, that was on Tisha B'Av. It will say the fourth month, blah, 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 in Jeremiah, I believe it's chapter 52. Uh, Jeremiah, by the way, Yermiyahu, I think altogether there's something like 27 messages that he brought to Jerusalem, but he actually brought to various nations. It says in chapter one, you are to speak to the nations as well as your own people. And he brought many messages about what was coming and folks gathered around them, their own prophets, to say, oh, everything's well, nothing's going to happen, all things are cushy, God's our sugar daddy. So Jeremiah was trying to prepare them for the truth of what was going to happen. It happened. You know, regardless of how God seemed to be a sugar daddy or not, it happened. So he destroyed Jerusalem along with uh, fighting or war that was prophesied. And this is one of the things that Yermiyahu prophesied in all of those 27 times. You can read it. You can look at your Strong's Concordance or something and list all the times it talks about fighting and war. Over and over again, he mentions it. Along with, with that falling, fighting and war, there was also prophesied a plague that would come just prior to Nebuchadnezzar finally destroying the place. Um, and that's mentioned many times. Uh, King James Version has it as pestilence. It's you know something that pesters you, but uh, it's it's a plague. Like a pestilence is a little bit more than that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a little bit more than that, but yeah, that's where we get the term. So near the end of the temple period is when this pestilence was to come. Jeremiah, who, uh, Jeremiah predicts this many times on many occasions not merely to Israel, but to the nations around Israel. Any questions so far? By the way, that Jerusalem fell 19 years after the initial strike, for whatever it's worth. A heavy warning is given to America's Jerusalem In the days that I just talked about a while ago, in the in the early 1500s time period into the 1600s, what we now call New York City was considered a new Jerusalem. It was kind of, it was, everything about it was thought to be Jerusalem. All the inhabitants were Jewish, so on and so forth. So there was a warning given to America's Jerusalem on September 11th, 2001. For two weeks, America was in a state of repentance, though not a complete return to Adonai kind of repentance, and not a complete return, certainly not, to Judeo-Christian ways of this nation. Since then, we have practically invited, quote-unquote, pestilence 
in, along with mental problems that once upon a time was only heard of among war veterans. There, is, there are mental problems that have been stated within the last 10 years, really within the last five or six years, that you would otherwise, even 10 years ago, only heard of among war veterans, such as PS, PTSD. How do you say that? PTSD. 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 Post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. You will hear that <coughs> in diagnosed of individuals who are raised in a good home, even a quiet home, but somewhere along the way, they developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And you'll hear of it even diagnosed. That is completely weird, but we are seeing it. We are seeing all kinds of stuff happen since about 19 years ago. Any questions so far or comments? Well, okay, yes. So that what the comment you just made is, is interesting. I mean, I see that. But, I mean, we used to have, like, insane asylums. So if you had a crazy person in your family, you just shipped them off to an insane asylum. We don't do that anymore. So, huh? Maybe we should? We should ship them to Congress. Oh, we should be the Congress. That's funny. So I'm just, I'm just saying, um, so I get what you're saying, post-traumatic stress disorder are you saying it exists more now or it's diagnosed more? Because we all know that there's more diagnosing of everything now than there ever was mm. before. So do you think it exists more now? What I'm saying is, okay, Brian, you're in the department, mm. so you can vouch for me or say I'm screwy. But I'm we're saying... Both. <laughs> we're both. Um, I'm saying that as much as 10 years ago, you would never have heard of a child who was raised in a good home did not have anything weird happen, just, you know, what happens to everybody, but just normal life. And you you would never hear of a child like that being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, okay, but doesn't the actual diagnosis itself lend to the fact that there was an instance that there created stress? A trauma. A trauma. Mm -hmm. right. right. So how could you say nothing happened to them? Well, I just, I know that there are folks that, if something did happen, the parents don't know about it. Or if something did happen, the grandparents don't know about it, stuff like that. Well, there happens, there appears to be a lot of sexual trauma from mm -hmm. right. what do you call the, not a pervert, well, a pervert, but a predator, sexual right. predator. Right. And kids by nature don't talk about it. Right. So I wouldn't think that you would say nothing happened. It's like maybe we don't know what happened. Stuff that we don't. Yeah, stuff that's not clarified. Yes, ma'am. In our culture now, victimhood is like a badge of honor. And I know of people who have made up a reality that was traumatized when, in fact, they were not. And so I think that's what you're saying. Now it's Hopefully. even like falsified trauma mm -hmm. So that they can be diagnosed with something, so that they can claim victimhood, so that they can feel like there's something important. Yeah, there are basically ah! two. I mean, I would think that's right. There are basically two hands to this. One is something happened that you know so and so did not mention to anybody. The other hand is what goes on in your brain. You can can create anything mm -hmm. depending on what thoughts you choose to capture, as Paul puts it, take captive, as he puts it, on the King James Version. In other words, grab them, if you grab the more normal, you grab what thoughts you want, okay? Even at nighttime when you dream, you can prepare your mind what to dream about. The more you grab noble thoughts, the healthy thoughts, the thoughts that are good thoughts, the thoughts that are biblical thoughts, the more you grab those, your brain will actually form. I learned this from Hack years ago, and we were watching a thing last night couple of nights ago on it but actually your brain will then grow little branches you know mm -hmm. and that that causes your brain to then develop Happen. those yeah your brain then focuses and makes those thoughts more a common thing yes ma'am and towel over here said very, and i'm probably not going to say it right things that uh it could also be an instance where normal life occurs but the child is convinced 
that right. that normal behavior is traumatic. That's what is, I'm getting at. It's like unacceptable. Right. That's what I'm about to get at. Yeah. You you have certain thoughts, and this one would be, and this is what we're seeing large scale, is, oh, what happened to me? You know, went out and picked wellness with grandpa or, or you know, I, I don't know, helped dad dig a hole somewhere, whatever. That was... Oh, that was so horrible. That was traumatic. That was child abuse. Well, if the hole and was you, to bury a body, it might have been. I'm just <laughs> No, I'm talking, I'm not. I just say it's an inch deep hole. Okay. But you convince <laughs> yourself that that inch deep hole that you just dug with your fingernail was a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. You can tell yourself lies. And then the more you repeat it, the more your brain believes it. And your brain will send that down that that yeah. thing, that, that, that nerve that runs from your brain into the rest of your body. And you've convinced your body what your brain has been concentrating on for so long. Telling yourself lies is the key. Right. Mm -hmm. And I agree, regardless of the situation, not to um, negate true trauma, because we know no, that no, people no. who have I know that that does yeah. exist, of course. I've. But yeah, there, are, there is more delusional behavior where people are telling themselves lies. And the more you tell yourself a lie, the more you start to believe. And that's that been prophesied. It's prophesied in Isaiah 66. And then Paul repeats the prophecy in Thessalonians. But, you know, the grand delusion that yeah. will happen in the last days. Gotcha. So, yes. And I'm going to get more into that in a little bit. Um, we have seen these things. Now, these things, this, the delusion part has been going back to the summer of 1970 was a really big start of that. But it really began to take hold, believe it or not, after about two weeks to a month after 9-11. We were all the nation was in a big repentance mode. And then all of a sudden we just, OK, that's done. You know, we repented. So everything will be all right. We can do absolutely whatever we, we, whatever we want. Now, that's called really loose Christianity where we'll just do this little bitty thing here and God will turn into our sugar daddy. and We can do whatever we want, you know. But the truth is. When the Lord gives a warning, it's called a warning. And that was a pretty harsh warning, would we all agree? About somewhere around near 3,000 people were in. By the way, that's also remember, that's a matter of remembrance, too. Remember the golden calf? How many people died in that? About 3,000 people. You can read it. But anyway, the, the matter here is God gives us warnings that we can also go back to the Bible and say, wow, that, hmm, that rings a bell. And tell us what we need to do. Repentance is not merely saying, oh, I'm really sorry for two weeks and then skipping it all together. Repentance means to turn around about face and do something entirely, completely, utterly different. And then you will be forgiven, it says repeatedly. Forgiveness doesn't come automatically. It comes when you are willing to repent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So another particular time came. Oh, did anyone else have something to say? I'm sorry. I'm what about preaching. you, Brian? Since we're all stepping on your well specialty, your area of expertise. You're right. You, you have to have had, you know, with regards specifically to PTSD, mm -hmm. um, you have to have had a traumatic life-threatening incident happen mm -hmm before you can even make that diagnosis. Right. So something happened to anyone, mm -hmm. at least in theory, uh, that has that diagnosis. Now they may be lying about it and they may be blowing it out of proportion or whatnot. But the converse of that is that the vast majority of people who experience a trauma on that level do not go on to develop PTSD. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of proposed reasons why that may be, but literally you can have two men in the same foxhole getting shot at in war and one gets developed PTSD and the other one does not. Right. They can go through an identical experience. And there's a number of other factors that we don't understand very clearly as to you know, why one may go on to develop it and another one isn't. And there's at least a genetic piece to it, but um, thankfully, originally, when this was first being fleshed out as a diagnosis back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and even into the 80s, it was thought that for your average American, 
experiencing a trauma on the scale that would prompt PTSD was a rare event. When they actually went out and started doing research and surveys on just, you, you know, sampling the average American and asking them, have they experienced a trauma of, of like this or this or this or this, check all the boxes and describe it if you can. It turns out about three quarters of Americans at some point in their life experience a trauma. And it's usually like car wrecks and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yet they don't walk away, the vast majority don't walk away with PTSD. Right. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But um, to some degree, there's a, a cultural influence on it. So, I'll check. So, for example, Um, places like Israel, where historically terrorism has been much more common, suicide bombers and you know, bombing cafe, roadside cafes and things like that, um, they have an incredibly low rate of PTSD compared to the number of traumas, serious, along those lines, traumas, their, their average population. And I don't want to paint Israel as like a you know, you're you're lucky to survive in this sort of place, but compared to a lot of other places in the world, in, in you know the first world, let's call it that, uh, they have way more than their fair share of uh, assaults, attacks, bombings, shootings, bombings, those sorts of things. Yet the the rate of PTSD in that population per capita is lower mm -hmm. than it is in Europe or the United States. Right, and part of that is because well. They raise them tougher. They know they're at risk and they don't whine and fuss and complain about it. By the same token, uh, there were people, a lot of people from World War II, veterans, that probably had PTSD, but, but never, they had the symptoms of it, but they were never diagnosed, number one, number two. The, the rate was probably lower than it was for like the Vietnam War or the Persian Gulf War or the Iraq or the Afghanistan War that we're still in to this day. <clears throat> because expectations were different back then, you know, that, and, and so we, and, and there's a lot, probably a lot of factors, and one of them may be what Rebecca was talking about, this kind of like playing the role of the victim for sympathy is encouraged mm -hmm. nowadays because it gets you all sorts of uh, privileges and special treatment mm -hmm. and in many cases money through disability and things like that. Um, it used to be 60, 70, 80 years ago when you get on welfare of any sort, disability of any sort, it was intended to be short term. You were embarrassed by the fact that you had to ask for a handout and you were highly motivated to get off of assistance as quickly as you could, including disability for medical purposes. Today, it's 180 degrees opposite. You are looking for an excuse to be diagnosed with something so that you can live off of disability. It's no longer an embarrassment, it's a badge of honor, what, what Rebecca was saying, mm -hmm. to have a diagnosis and to parade it around and expect special treatment from others. And so I think that's only <laughs> escalated in the last 20 years as we've turned from a society of, you know, independent, responsible for ourselves uh, adults into uh, predominantly dependent on somebody else, often the government, but not always, um, whiny crybabies. And such dependency and such lack of a spine is encouraged and taught because you deserve this, you, you've earned it, you, you exist, you're a human being, and therefore, 
just because you exist, you need a, a, a paycheck. You know, you have a right to a job, whether you can actually do a job or not. You have a right to your job and a right to your paycheck and a right to this. All these rights were invented mostly in the last 50 years um, as a way to control people and make people dependent on others instead of independent. And so I think that's been accelerating in the last 20 years. Um, and not just because of 9 11, although that was probably for a certain portion of the population, particularly the conservative side of the population, that's been true. I think for other factors, for other portions of the population, other other things were key moments, including certain shootings and whatnot that have happened over the last 10 years or so. Yeah, I agree with that. But my, I had had a couple experiences with like vets and the family or whatever. You remember Mr. Ed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he was my neighbor and like adopted grandpa, like adopted family or whatever. But he came back from World War II and he had a broken back and he was in uh, Heinz mom. Hospital in Chicago. <laughs> and he had a broken back and he was not doing well at all. And we know this by not just his report, but the chief nurse of the hospital who was caring for him at the time, happened to eventually later fall in love with him and marry him, and that was Miss Josephine. So she was able to give her report of what was happening to this patient and her care at the same time. But she said he had a broken back. It was bad. Kind of like mine. Huh? Kind of like mine. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't know medical term-wise right. how bad, but she said it was really bad broken back from mm -hmm. the active war, whatever. Yeah. And so, um, but he remembers that they canceled him or gave him some options and he could have taken full disability at that point. He, he qualified for full disability. Mm -hmm. um, he, they also offered to pay for schooling for him. And out of independence, pride, you know, I'm not sure, you know, what you would call that, but mm -hmm. he turned it all down. And he went and put himself into school to become a jeweler mm. and then became the you know a watchmaker and the service manager for Bulba. So when he was 93 years old, I take him to the VA mm -hmm. when he does need health care at the end there, you know, mm -hmm. he was never even in the system. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have him in the system because the records had been burnt from Hans when he was there in a fire mm -hmm. in storage in the seventies or something. And so they had no record of him. He'd never even been there. And they went back and he, he should have received over a million dollars of income from them, you income, know, yeah. or whatever, or what benefits or whatever, mm -hmm. disability mm -hmm. benefits, things like that, that he really mm -hmm. did qualify for, but because he never applied, you know, they start from the day you apply. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he just walked away from that. He never, he never whined, he never cried. He just, you know, pulled up his bootstraps and just kept on going and made a good life for well, That's what we're talking about. You know, the, there was a time prior, certainly prior to the Industrial Revolution and yes, prior to uh, that war that was just prior to that and, you know, all the wars that you hadn't, little choice that a lot of times just than, other than to pull up your bootstraps uh, trail of tears you know all, I can think of all kinds of stuff that's happened in America that would give if it happened nowadays we'd all you know well we at least burn a few cities and stuff but but the, the matter at one time was to you know grin and bear it and make the best out of it you know you are responsible for yourself and there was no collectivism once upon a time. And there was no, you know, identity politics once upon a time. It was just simply, we are individuals. We I will stand before God alone one day. Uh, no one but myself and, you know, me, myself, and I will be there to stand before God. And so I stand before him now just as I will then. I may as well make the best of it. And, you know, by his grace and his power, yes, I walk with him. And that's just the way it was for a long time mm -hmm. until we, you know, all of a sudden things began to change and we began to think, well, I, I'm owed this and I'm owed this and I'm owed this. And I'm, you know, 
I can sit at home and rot and unload this. But that's kind of a little bit of what we're talking about. And there's also the what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the the individual who sets aside the, you know, because maybe he's young, whatever reasons, life is tough, being a decent halfway decent person is hard, it's tough. I'm gonna to set that person aside, the more noble person, take up the sick person and live that life because the sick person I can get funding for that, I can get attention for that, and and it's a little easier rather than be noble. That also, of course, has been going on, particularly in the last five years, especially, which is the next thing I'll get into. Um, it was between April of 2014 until September of 2015. Now, we probably don't remember this too well. It was quite fascinating when it was going on, but I still remember when I say April 2015, Passover 2014, until September 2015, i.e. Sukkot of that year, there were four, it's called a tetrad, tetrad, four blood red moons that are prophesied primarily in Joel and in Revelation and a few places for the last days. Uh, four times that these lunar eclipses happened, they created a moon that was quite red. And they happened, all four of them, on biblical holidays. All four of them happened on the biblical calendar's holidays. Now, folks that just saw them and didn't know the biblical calendar, only knew the Roman calendar that we all live by, would not might not have gotten the message quite so clearly. But at the time, I knew, okay, something is up here. Something's a little bit creepy, a little bit more creepy than just a lunar eclipse. There happens before with them within the span of, you know, these months within the biblical calendar. They're all falling on biblical special times. And I really didn't pull it all together until thereafter seeing what happened thereafter that was how many years ago that was five years ago how many of us i hear this every day when i go to work we all talk about there's somebody that i will meet they may be people that are just visiting the workplace from somewhere else looking for books to buy they may be somebody coming in to help they may be people that have been working there for 20 years but somebody will say my son my daughter my my cousin, my, you know, somebody, uh, you know, just within the last couple of years or whatever, within always in the last five years, uh, became a homosexual or something of the sort. I hear it every day. And so it's been very much increased. I go to the store and somebody will say at the grocery store, we'll talk about it. I see it. I hear it all the time. It's going on in a huge amount. It is called the grand delusion. In the last days, it's spoken of in Isaiah 66, and Paul repeats it. In the last days, why? Because they were not lovers of the truth. And again, so you trade something more noble like the truth for something lesser than the, the ever so wonderful, popular prodigal son story. When that happened five years ago, four years ago in 2016, the MJAA conference, the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America conference, could hardly go about its business and have a conference because all of the rabbis were saying this, all of the leadership were saying the same thing, even if they weren't rabbis, they were saying, our sons and our daughters came to us and said, made this announcement last year. And you know, or this year, just before this conference and so forth. Everybody was saying that they could hardly get through the conference. This thing hit the Messianic Jewish community first and thereafter the rest of Christianity. Prior to that, it was happening in the world for zillions of years. We'll just say this year, zillions of years. No one cared. There was a time period you'd keep it quiet. But all of a sudden, it began to happen to the First, the Messianic Jewish community, and this is, guess what happened? When I, when I gave my testimony, I spoke of my, my dad's passing and the three years that, you know, he went to the hospital, 
three years in a row, well, two years in a row on Tisha B'Av and the third year on Tammuz the 17th, the golden calf, you know, the beginning of the golden calf incident, Tammuz the 17th, and also the beginning of three weeks. And I presented that within my testimony first where I work, because I thought, well, this is such and such place of work, and they're, they're going to know what I'm talking about, because I don't really know. I don't have it all figured out, so maybe they will. I gave it here, just because by the time I gave it here, that testimony, I, I was kind of into it by that time, but I didn't really have it figured out. Why on earth, God, did you have this happen? And it, it, I really felt it revolved around our youngest, and it did. I, I knew of all kinds of historic events that happened on Tisha B'Av, on the ninth of the biblical month of Av, which is the day when most calamities happen. But I was looking at all the events. I didn't look at one. The Roman burning down of the temple and destroying Jerusalem began. They broke through the gates. They broke through the gates of the temple area in on 17th of Tammuz, destroyed the temple on the 9th of Av. Gates, you know, as in lift up your heads, O ye gates, so the king may come in. The word gates, translated gate sha'ar, is the same word for the opener, the gatekeeper. Same word. Sha'ar, sha'ar, but there weren't vowels once upon a time. It's the same word. So when they busted through the gates, they were busting through the leadership, if mm -hmm. you will, right. of Jerusalem. 17th of Tavamuz, my father passed away. What was the message being sent? It was thereafter, that was 2011. It was thereafter that we had the blood red moons and thereafter that something broke through the gates, the gatekeepers, the leadership of the church. Yes? 2015 is when the... Uh, you it was still have the... Uh, can you say it? Yeah. It, was, it was June 26, 2015 was when the, the, uh, the Supreme Court lifted the ban on same-sex marriages right. and not nationwide. Right. Oh. That might have something to do with it. Yeah, right. So basically that's one form of leadership mm -hmm. that got blown through. Right. And what did the White House look like at that time? It was all... All the lights that were shining around the White House, they they purposely made it the rainbow. Yes. Well, yeah, because the, of that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. In the Bible, the rainbow is God's throne. I mean, they would probably, and the world will pervert that. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, granted, I imagine, I think they generally distinguish in some way between it and the rainbow. But. Yeah. Yeah. Well... So what I'm saying is, is yeah, I think they're they yeah. Really yeah, I mean, whatever whatever ignorance has been going on for a day or two, a week or whatever, and for the decision that was made, the White House, the decision that was made was with the rainbow at the White House declaring, "This is God. We are God. We made this decision." Whether or not they really believe that or not is beside the point. Yeah. Okay. In the Bible, where the rainbow exists, it's God's throne. So, you know, that. So, yes, five years ago, during the, that time period, the blood red moon time period. So, the these things have been going on. And the blood red moons were just simply, to me, another wake up call, another warning. And so here we are 19 years later, and I, you know, who knows, maybe COVID-19 is called into COVID-19 for a reason other than, you know. It was founded in the year 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it came to America in what year? 2020. But nonetheless, I, you know, I'm not going to mess too much with COVID-19 aside from it does mean a Roman crown. Corona means a Roman crown. That's what the word means. It's kind of perhaps the crown, maybe they're calling it that because it's the crown of viruses. I don't know. But uh, there could be a link there between the, the, uh, the pestilence or the plague that was to hit Jerusalem and Israel just prior to its final destruction. 
Can I make a comment on that? One? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that today. So Second Chronicles seven thirteen, mm -hmm. yeah. right. the one before the one we always preach, right. talks of the pestilence. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. seven thirteen yes. talks about the pestilence that's coming. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. So, anyways, is there a relationship that's between that's what was going on back then mm -hmm. and what? What you were just talking about, and then when that was written in Second Chronicles versus yeah. where we are now. Yeah. Are you looking that up? Yeah. What's the chapter? Thirty-two, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles seven thirteen. Oh, seven. Cause of the pestilence, and then seven fourteen is the if my people who are called my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. We'll hear. We'll hear land for good mother's name. It starts in 12. Okay. Uh, chapter 7, verse 12. I don't know, I appeared to Shalomo Solomon by night and said to you, him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the sky so that there is no rain, or if I order locusts to devour the land, or if I send an epidemic of sickness among my people, then if my people who bear my name will humble themselves, pray, Seek my face and turn from their evil ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Right. And that's why I say every time you read about forgiveness, it's preceded by repentance. Turn from their evil ways. It's not a... I'm using this word a lot tonight. I don't know necessarily why, but it's not a sugar daddy thing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a reality, you know, skip the, you know, the modern cartoon world that we're in, but you know, stick with reality. Now, I want to go from there to, and this is something I'm going to talk about for a little bit that um, I I kind of, I, I knew about it back when it was first announced um, about 16 years ago, and I kind of didn't say anything about it after my wife and I had a small discussion about it. I'm going to mention it tonight. I'm not trying to prophesy. I'm not trying to set dates or anything like that. I'm just going to tell you what we all somewhere in the back of our minds know. But now I'm going to do that after I present this thing called rapture. <laughs> okay, so we know, okay, weird things are going on. So we're all going to get raptured away before it gets too weird, right? I don't know. <laughs> We're admiring your um, your skills of handling cooking. <laughs> you're, you're handling the Bible and a small creature all yeah. at the same time. <laughs> Dual wielding. <laughs> Multitasking right there. Right. Sadly, yeah. you can just barely oh, see Cookie mm -hmm. in the face. You should like hold Cookie up okay. and say, yeah, the there's Cookie! There's <laughs> one small dog here, one large dog there, and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it'd be more impressive if you don't. Yeah, I don't Jack up here, yeah, yeah, that would. Yeah. Then you just lay down the Bible and say, "You're on a Superman," but no. Um, okay, Matthew chapter twenty-four. Our Lord actually tells us when this is all going to take place. I know that somebody about 180, 185 years ago created this thing called uh, pre-trib rapture. It was never heard of before this guy invented that. Okay, no one ever would have believed, but he got it across and we all jumped on it and it's been like it's Bible ever since. You won't read of it in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Matthew 24, verse 29. But immediately following the trouble of those times, the sun will grow dark, the moon will stop shining, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. That's a quotation from a great many prophets. Uh, there's a, I, I wrote down a bunch. I wrote down half a page of biblical prof prophetic references that mention all of these things that just got mentioned here in Matthew 24, all for the last days. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. This is quoting from, uh, from Zechariah chapter 12. When the Lord comes back, we'll look upon him and we have pierced and mourned for him. All the tribes will mourn. Uh, then all the all the tribes of the land will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. 
which is another quote from Daniel, with tremendous power and glory. He will send out his angels with a great shofar, which is another quote, and they will gather together his chosen people from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. It's called rapture. When is this going to happen? What did I just read? When did it say it's going to happen? Verse 29. After the tribulation. After the tribulation of those days. Not prior, not even in the middle of. After the tribulation of those days. It says it right here. Verse 29, Matthew 24 says. <laughs> Wait, Matthew 24, 29? Yeah. Or 29, 24? Matthew 24, 29. Yes. Okay. And so, okay. So our Lord, Jesus, Yeshua, <laughs> King of the universe, said it right here. Okay. Now, they, I told you that, that that bit about the sun will grow dark, moon will stop shining, stars fall from sky, powers of heaven will be shaken. It's mentioned in a great many prophetic areas, uh, not merely Isaiah. We all love Isaiah. But uh, not merely, he's not the only prophet. But um, I want to take you to one more place where that is mentioned. It's in Revelation. Now, this is where you'll hear other folks say, well, <laughs> you know, there's these silly people that say this is going to happen this way and all that sort of thing. And they'll downplay folks like myself. I'm not trying to set dates. I'm not trying to be a prophet here. Um, in a predictive way, I'm just trying to read to you. You can make up your own mind. One more place where stars are mentioned from falling from the sky and stuff. Revelation chapter 8. I'm going to start at verse 10. Third Which chapter, sorry. Revelation chapter 8. 10, verse 10. Verse 10. Tell you what, I'll just start at verse 6 and read all of them. Okay, <laughs> I know. At least through chapter eight, anyway. Uh, now the seven angels of seven shofars, seven shofars, you know, rams were, um, prepared to sound them. The first one sounded a shofar, and there came hail and fire mingled with blood, and it was thrown down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, all the green grass was burned up. Okay, before I go on to the second shofar, did that affect planet earth, or did it affect... People on planet Earth. 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 Okay. Earth. Affected planet Earth. 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 Yeah. Earth. A third of the Earth. A third of the trees. trees were burned, and a third of the grass. Okay. Doesn't mention. Oh, any, all the grass. All grass. Doesn't 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 all mention green any. Grass. Doesn't mention any humans. Verse eight. The second angel sounded so far, and what looked like a, an enormous blazing mountain was hurled into the sea. A third of the sea. Turned to blood, a third of the living creatures of the sea died, a third of the ships were destroyed. Any direct mention of humans? Nope. Okay. Verse 10, the third angel sounded a shofar, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky onto a third of the rivers and onto the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness, King James says, wormwood. And a third of the water became bitter, and many people died from the water that had been turned bitter. Now we begin to hear of some people, okay? A third of them. Verse 12. It just says many. Yeah, okay, sorry. You're, you are correct. Many people died from the water. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded a shofar, and a third of the sun was struck, also a third of the moon, a third of the stars, and a third of them that were dark in the day had had a third less light in the night likewise. And nothing mentioned there, humans. Then I looked and I heard a lone eagle give a loud cry. And as it flew in mid heaven, whoa, 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 oi, oi, oi. When you mention something twice in the Bible, that puts extra emphasis. When you mention something three times in a row, that's heavy, heavy, heavy emphasis. Like holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty. It's like... You know, holy as it said, part house of part can you get? Well, the Lord Almighty. Here there's three oys, three woes in a row. That's like extraordinary warning. Woe to the people, not to planet Earth, the people on planet Earth. Because of the remaining blessed from the three angels who have yet to sound their shofar. So there seems to be a bit of a, a connection here, or a, not a connection, but a difference between the shofars, the blast of these trumpets, if you will, from verse 13 onward versus the ones before that. 
So the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet blasts will be horrible for the people. Right. The people remaining. Remaining. Because here we have what is described in all those passages in the prophets, as well as our Lord in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 19. Here we have mentioned in these couple of shofar blessed, stars falling from the sky and so forth. Just like that. Now, there was a person who had a dream about a year ago. I posted this person talking to Sid Roth on my Facebook wall. He had a dream. I know folks have dreams all the time. I posted on there and said, for what it's worth, you know, maybe it's not worth anything. No one, no one said a thing to it or responded to it, and that's fine. I don't care. I just put it up there in case somebody wanted to watch it. He had a dream that this big rock was falling from the sky and came to planet Earth. And just before or as it hit planet Earth, all of the believers were lifted up. They were picked up so that the destruction that happened to planet Earth, they'd be out of the way. And then they were all, they all came to Jerusalem after that, which, by the way, if you read the whole Bible, that's the end of the story there. And we all get taken to Jerusalem. But nonetheless, he had that dream and he identified in the dream, he identified it as Wormwood, the thing coming out of the sky. Well, let me read my little note here. The, the name of that particular rock, again, I am, <laughs> I, I really struggle to say this, but I really don't want to. But um, anyway, I'll go ahead and say it. The rock that is supposed to come to planet Earth along about April the 13th, I didn't even write it down because I didn't want to say it. April the 13th of 2029 is called Apophilus, something like that. I can't remember what they call it, but April 13th, 2029, by the way, in Israel, that's Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel. They said this, they announced this, NASA announced this in 2024. They were a bit shaken themselves about it, but they have... Wait, wait, it's not 2024 yet. When did they announce it? 2004, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. They announced in 2004. I'm sorry, I'm getting my 20s and my zeros mixed up. That's okay. Well, you straightened out. They announced it in 2004, and they were a little bit shaken, and I thought it was interesting. My wife and I talked about it for a day or two and then went on. They have talked about it a lot since then as well. Some will say, well, it could actually hit the planet. Others say, well, it's going to come within you know, 20,000 uh, miles. Some say, well, within, you know, actually underneath the skyline or the satellites. There's variations on which NASA person talks. They're not necessarily all in agreement because it's at, well, it hasn't happened yet. But they know that you can look at the graph. It will come. It's a uh, it's not a huge, huge drug, but actually if it, if it hit it, if it hit planet Earth, it would be a great deal more effective than, you know, the uh, nuclear bomb that is dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, it would annihilate something about as big as Texas or so. If it came, it didn't hit planet Earth, it would, and, you know, just stay like, say, below satellite level, uh, you know, the most distance that you'll read about, or maybe come within, you know, high building level. It would still do a lot to planet Earth. You don't get that close. You don't come somewhere near the atmosphere without having some effects on various things, but it would have some effect. But there are folks that are calling this wormwood, and they're usually most folks will look at them and say, you're crazy. You're idiots. But it was NASA that actually first brought this up for whatever it's worth. I'm just throwing that out there. Throw that out there. Yeah. So... Yeah. Uh, Apophis. A P O P H I S. They're they're saying it'll miss Earth at building top level. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, <laughs> if, if it's any building top level, it's hit us. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it depends on who you're. Why you let Cal read stuff about it? Sure. 
Uh, I guess in Sperma it says it's estimated to be approximately 370 meters yeah. in diameter. Mm -hmm. But it said that yeah, it's not it said when in 2004 the probability was up to 2.7 percent that it would hit Earth on the date you mentioned. Right. Um, a little later, like they changed likelihoods several times. Right. And it, there's some that says that preliminary observations by radar in 2013 effectively ruled out the possibility of an Earth impact in 2036. And then later, that probability of impact on that date has been eliminated. And then now it's looking at highest probability of impact is on April 12th, 2016. And the odds on that date that's calculated by, you know, risk table, whatever, are one in 150,000. Right. So there are variations of this particular theme. And I'm not, you know, let's just say, I'll just say it this way. If it does not happen, Okay, if nothing is really heard or whatever, you'll see Ron Smith out dancing and having a good time <laughs> because of it. Okay, I'm 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 not trying to paint anything unnecessarily here. But let's just say for the you know for the sake of kicks and giggles that this I mean it is coming. It's just a matter of what it hurts and what it doesn't hurt. Um, the for kicks and giggles. Time is short. Okay, the you'll hear creatures say for you know century and a half now, and we're in the last days. And I agree. I would agree since along about May of 1948 that we're in the last days. In fact, can a nation be formed at once? The word at once pa'am means a knocking on the door. I will say that the Lord's been knocking on the door of our hearts since the day Jerusalem, since the day that Israel was voted in as a legal state. So, do yes. You, do you agree, Rebecca, that we're in the last days? Because you made a statement about that to me today that I was actually surprised to hear you say. So do you believe we're in the last days? The way I speak of it is if these are the end of days, but there are a lot of things that have to line up, not just a wormwood, mm -hmm. but there's several things. Mm -hmm. And like one of the things is the peace treaty. Right. Israel, um, you know, and signing that, a peace treaty. And when's that going to be finally ratified? I, I don't know. It's in a few days. In a few days. It's going to be during the festivals. And... So if you just start looking at all of the different pieces that have to fall into place, mm -hmm. yeah, some of them are looking like they're happening, um, but not all of them yet. Right. So it's like I'm still I'm still watching. Oh yeah. And I'll be watching until the day I look up and he's coming in the clouds mm -hmm. on a, on a white horse. Right. And you know I'll I'll be doing the happy dance that you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. Now, let's just say for kicks and giggles that it's another 50 years, okay? Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now, if it's a 50 years away or a 1,000 years away, what we're seeing now is a warning. We're seeing warnings. Mm -hmm. Be it 9-11, be it I would say that's a heavy warning. Well, wouldn't you say that God... He does, out of love whatever he can mm -hmm. to draw people to him mm -hmm. to not just so he can have happy little followers but because he wants to see us mentally sound mm -hmm. healthy unafraid mm -hmm. courageous not celebrating victimhood I mean he wants to see us live life to the fullest mm -hmm. And all of those pieces that you're talking about, some of them aren't happy. Some of them are happy. You know, he'll use all of that mm -hmm. to draw us to himself being draw us toward love. Mm -hmm. The way Jeremiah put it, and I'm mentioning Jeremiah here because, again, he was the prophet that went to the nations and to the common people. 
Ezekiel actually went into, you know, exile along with Jeremiah. And I'm not, I don't remember Isaiah. All these three, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel were all contemporaries. But I'm, I'm focusing here on Jeremiah because of what I said. Jeremiah gives the same words that Moses did, or God said through Moses. He said, I, God said through Jeremiah, I'm setting before you life and death. Mm-hmm. You know, Moses said the same thing. You know, life and death, sickness or health, all these things. You know, choose life. Yes, ma'am. You say yes, ma'am, and it's so right. All right. Yes, Rebecca, my dear, my spouse, my segula, my treasure. <laughs> Now I really can't remember what I was talking about. Wait, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay. I don't tend to get wrapped up in... (laughs) Hopefully I'll get caught up and wrapped up in rapture and then taking up and going to Jerusalem. But I don't tend to fixate on... On, on this issue in particular. Mm-hmm. And it's not because I don't want it to happen. I want Jesus to come back. I want to be the Revelation 21, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm definitely that person. Oh, yeah. But it says, will he find us working? Mm-hmm. Will he find us with faith in the world? Okay, so I have to live every day dealing with what's in front of me. Mm-hmm. As God gives it to me. And the the thing, you know, maybe maybe you could say it's naive, but I truly believe that when it's time, when it's almost here, mm-hmm. God's gonna tell me in a million ways, undeniable, visible, biblical proofs mm-hmm. that he's coming back mm-hmm. in three and a half years or seven years. Or in the blink of an eye. Yeah, on the day that no man knows. Mm -hmm. So. But you are no man. I'm no man. (laughs) Lord of the Rings quote right there. I am no man. (laughs) Um, I'm a girl. I believe God. He prepares me. He prepares the steps for a righteous person. And he will prepare my steps so that I am aware Unless I'm being a bum, you know, (laughs) off playing in the backyard somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not worried about it. And I'm not afraid of it. Even if, like, right now, little stuff tends to just wipe me out. I'm not strong Mm -hmm. enough. We talked about this. I don't feel strong enough right now. By the time he shows up on our doorstep, (laughs) I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be strong enough for the tribulation. I'm going to be strong enough for a taking away and, you know, transplanting me in Jerusalem. I'm going to be okay. That won't happen if you're strength, by the way. You won't, you won't have to be strong for that. That won't happen of your strength. You'll just take it. Right. I'm not going to go woo and wave my wings and yeah, blow that way. <laughs> but I am going to be able to handle that. With courage and strength at the time that I need it. All right. So when I did good. So when I was thinking about, I mean, today, again, you know, I'm, I'm my, this comes with my apologies. I got this primarily this morning. In fact, I was running outside over and over again, like, okay, Lord, what, you know. Well, what is the, I, I'm, I'm still. I'm saying that for, uh, Maybe it's just me, but I'm struggling with what it is you got. You know, what is overarching? I'm trying to go trying ahead to and yeah, finish that statement. But uh, <laughs> but as I was praying, I said, okay, Lord, what? Okay, I get, I got that. I, I'm forming these notes in my mind and so forth. But Lord, what, what would be the end result? What's, what's the end result? What's the, okay, now this has been delivered. Now what do we do? Kind of, you know. Lord, what do you want us to do in response to the knowledge that we've been getting these warnings and seeing, you know, America turn from a Judeo-Christian nation to something, you know, mimicking, I don't know, Russia, 
a hundred years ago or Germany a hundred years ago. You know, so what, what should we do? Well, here's what I got. If we should all look at our lives very, very honestly, humble ourselves, seek his face, and pray and turn from our wicked ways, meaning check our hearts, be sure that there is no wicked way. I'm, me, I, I can count some things. I can be real honest with myself. My heart has wickedness. But when I stand before God, I'm going to stand alone. I'm not going to stand with you, my dear. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to stand alone. And I'm going to have to account for my life. My salvation is done. My lifestyle is another thing. I'm going to have to account for my works, as it puts it, and be judged therein. And I'll be welcomed in, but he's going to let me know how I did. That's right. And it will be with each of us that way. Yep. Personal responsibility trumps mob responsibility. <laughs> in other words, and that comes in daily life. Wherever you work, okay, let's take this to the job. Wherever you work, there will be a particular mob standard. And there will be times when you're... Your convictions of personal responsibility will go a step above that mob standard, then go a step above that mob standard. Personal responsibility is bigger and higher and more important than mob responsibility. So it is when I stand before God, it's going to be the same way. And I stand before him now, just as I will stand before him then. So therefore, in my daily walk, in my daily walk, what? Mamadis was asked, when should I repent? He said, the day before you die. In other words, every day. Lead a life that is a life of repentance. My Lord, I want to turn to you. I want to turn to you. I want to turn to you. And may he cleanse me. When we're looking at a nation going way weird, the least we can do is say, Lord, cleanse me. I want to be more like you rather than the sickness that I see going on. And then may we turn around and be able somehow, through his grace, help those who are struggling mentally, spiritually, and so forth. Find a little help. And Lord, please provide folks to kick the VA in the hind end and cause them to hire good doctors. Yes, we should have prayed about that. We will right now. No, we did. We did. A um, couple of things. Yes, long, he's on. Um, Paul wrote more than once about you know running the race, finishing the race, um, and there's running through the finish line. You don't pull up short of the finish line. You don't stop running the race at the tail end of the race. Um, just because you can see the finish line five yards ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, how many times have, have athletes lost their lead because they slacked up, they thought they were way out in front and there was somebody nipping at their heels mm -hmm. and they let up the last second and somebody else blew right past them and got first place in, in the foot race or right. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that the analogy that he uses of you know running the race is of course a, living a complete life from the get-go as early as you can all the way out all the way through the finish line um, and of course the problem or the challenge that he's alluding to is we don't know when the finish line may happen sometimes we have a little bit of an idea mm -hmm. that my life you know I, I have terminal illness like my father did with cancer and he only had so many years to live and it turns out the estimate was pretty dead on and um, the, the last couple of days it was obvious that he didn't have but just mere days left but you know we didn't know the exact hour mm -hmm. but he ran his race pretty faithfully to the end now if we're talking about the tribulation and the rapture we don't pull up short just because we've hit seven years of tribulation, even if we know that that's what we're in. Right. Whether we know or we don't know. Mm -hmm. he, he may bless us and let us know 
can give us some clear signs, or we may misinterpret them, you know, and miss the signs. Um, and some people won't, some people will, and some people, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not kind of like Rebecca, I'm not too worried about that mm -hmm. um, as much as I'm worried about finishing the race, oh, yeah. even if we're all going to cross the, the finish line at the same time mm -hmm. because of the end of the, set, the tribulation. Um, and then secondly, I'm not going to be too riled up until NASA starts recruiting deep sea oil rig drillers <laughs> and Aerosmith reunites and starts writing a theme song for this movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then we'll know who the true is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, okay, I mean, so I'd like to add to that. Sure. But, um, I feel sure. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I feel blessed. You know, I don't even get your humor, so that's what I'm just going to say. It's my, that is, it's, I, it's you are much more intelligent than I am, obviously. What's that called? Armageddon. Oh, okay. So there's uh, the sons and daughters of Issachar. Mm -hmm. Do what? I'm sorry. What's that? His sons and daughters of Issachar. The I listened to that thing, and I spent the whole time thinking, what on earth does that mean? So, so you know how some people have like a spirit of Elijah or some, you know, some people, or something like that. Like you're just saying that you kind of have that similar anointing to that spirit, personality, that, was, yeah. that personality, that similar anointing or whatever that was carried on this other person. So everyone is their own person, obviously. But I do believe just like we, you know, some people seem to be like a Cyrus or some people seem to be like a Yahoo or some people seem to be, you know, not a Yahoo. There are a lot of Yahoos. We need more Yahoos. Let's go with that. Um, I believe that there are people who are sons and daughters of Issachar. They know what time it is. They're watching. Um, things have been revealed to them by the Lord, by the through the Holy Spirit, that maybe other people aren't seeing yet. I just do, I just feel that way, and I honestly feel a little blessed that that we've been shown some of that. Um, so so I do feel like we do see some signs of the times and some things like that that some people are still blind to to an extent. And I know that there's a lot of people that see even more than than yeah. I do for sure. But but I do feel blessed to feel like I. I have been shown a little bit, and I'm a little more aware. Like just just being aware of the feasts and festivals and the biblical calendar versus the Gregorian calendar has been a huge blessing and eye opener yeah. in our life for ten years. Well, something that you're mentioning there, I'm going to put it ever so slightly differently. Right. Is you're talking about naivety versus well, if there's if we ever go through the prophets, there's what here's I'm going to introduce them. Uh, uh, I've I've yeah. noted here before that our eyes, our ears, our hands, our feet <laughs> are dual endings rather than masculine or feminine endings. You know, a naim, os naim, yadaim, raglaim. You know, dual ending meaning when you hear something with a dual ending aim, that means it experiences the physical and spiritual. It's capable of experiencing both physical and spiritual simultaneously. Yerushalayim is another one of those words. There's a physical Jerusalem and a spiritual Jerusalem hovering above it. Read it in Revelation. It'll come down to this physical Jerusalem when the Lord comes back. Saying that to say, if there's anything that the prophets scream about throughout the prophets, it's why can't you see like I see? Why can't you hear like I hear? You're made in the same image of God as I am. You're made as his likeness, just like I am. I'm an ordinary human being. You're a human being. Why can't you see and hear like I can see and hear? Why are you so naive otherwise? And that's the deal. Here's naivety. Here's being able to see and hear. Just like, you know, we're humans. We're not animals. Okay, animals can't do those things. And so what you're talking about is stepping out of naivety to God's reality more and more. 
And maybe the reason I was using the word sugar daddy so much tonight is because that's part of the naivety. Well, God, he's, uh, he's going to do whatever I want him to do. You know, he's not God anymore. You know, your God is somewhere along the way, Pentecostalism became something other than the festival in the Bible called Pentecost. Now, that being said, God doesn't always get his way. God always gets his way. You think? Every second of the day, every millisecond. Oh, no. Being God and all that. Well, but doesn't, isn't there somewhere in the Bible Who's where, God? isn't there somewhere in the Bible where it says, if my people would mm -hmm. do this, mm -hmm. like, okay, for instance, it's not his will that anyone should perish. Right. The scripture says mm -hmm. that. But we do know that some people will We're made, perish. We are made in his image and as his likeness. So if he had his way. We don't way, understand that phrase. If we, he had his way, none would perish. But we do know that some we, people do perish, right? We recognize that he has his way every millisecond. What we don't recognize is we're made in his image and as his likeness. We don't know what that means. We do not know what that means. We don't realize that we're, we're made you just like God. <laughs> we're made to be just like God. We have a will as well. We have a strong will, in fact, mm -hmm. just like God does. Some children are stronger than others. <laughs> and because of the will that's inside of us, because we're made just like God, as his likeness, that means we also fight against him. And he allows it because he's made us just like him. He honors that. And he will have his way. Well, is he dependent on us to any extent no. to help do the work of the, in the fields and the harvest or he, anything like that? I'm going to get into this in Luke 18. Okay. We must come to him as little children, right? Yes. yes. Okay. When Adam and Eve was created, what happened immediately after they were created? He gave them planet Earth to rule. And rule, yeah. And have dominion over. Rule and have dominion over. That's the kingdom. That's kingdom language right there, right after they created, i.e. children. Mm -hmm. So the he gives us, it's not that he creates us and say, hey, find something to control. He gives us dominion to because it's his, it's his planet, it's his universe, but he turns it over to us. That is part and parcel of this will. He will have it his way all the time. Part of his way is here. Take care of this. His way is to give us some free will. And yeah. stuff. That's what you're saying. I'm a father. I understand this. Yeah. Because I know he doesn't want anyone to perish, but yet some people will perish. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why. Also, that's now, if we, that's none of us were created with free will, i.e. just like God, then, yeah, I could find fault all over the place. But mm -hmm. we're, we're giving away. If we were not given free will, I wouldn't believe the Bible. So. Good. Well, that was a nice topic for debate. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I was, I guess I didn't even, it didn't even really dawn on me last night that it was going to be 9-11 today and so on and so forth. And I just woke up, not still yet, not thinking of it. And I just had this come across me. And then, duh, it's 9-11, really? I'm a little slow. but um, So I thought I would talk about that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my dear. <laughs> I don't want to be called, man. It's I just feel like I might have missed something here. How are you tying 9-11 to the end of the age? Um, I just thought I would take, as like I said at the beginning, what has happened since 9-11, since those days, and what warnings have come since that was obviously a, a big startling warning. You know, it startled all of us. And what has happened since then, and what is it telling us? And in other words, we're hit, being hit with some warnings, not just one, but a few, saying, okay, get, let's wake up. Let's wake up. And the church has been asleep for a while, all 10 virgins. And it's time to wake up and get, come out of your naivety. Don't be willingly naive, especially willingly naive. Okay. So. I agree. Um, I just feel like I do not disagree. But I think that, we'll just say for me, 
that particular occurrence was far less a, an indicator than the cultural shift that calls evil good and good evil. Right. Because that has accelerated exponentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, Just since I've been alive. Right. And I'm, you know, I know that we've had, I know there is nothing new under the sun. You know, there, there has been sexual impurity since very early <laughs> in the whole story. Yes. Uh, but the complete shift, the cross of calling good evil and evil good. Mm-hmm. That's pretty hard to do in mass. Yeah. And we're there. We're way past there. Right. Well, that's what I was trying to say within, and thank you. I was trying to say that within, you know, what has happened. It's, yeah, it's always been there, but then it started really very, very much affecting the church, individuals within the mm-hmm. church, many, many individuals within the church. Right. Yeah. I didn't mean to eliminate the church when I say culture because church has its own. Um, culture um and it's in the same place yeah if Great you look at a away, progressive so church yeah. they're calling evil good right. and good evil right. so and I, and my point there wasn't that that's just one of the things that's actually in the bible yeah the the twin towers being struck and it being truly evil mm-hmm. um that's not in scripture. And so when you start seeing things that are directly in scripture, plainly written, mm-hmm. that that that's what we should be looking for. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I understand what you were doing with it, and that's great. Um, I, for me, it's just me. Yeah, for what it's worth, there. I thought I'd start at 9-11 because today's 9-11. Yeah. I'm <laughs> extraordinarily simple. Yeah, but I... I uh, the and nine eleven, two thousand one, the night prior to, two thousand ten, long about seven or eight o'clock, I went over to a fellow's house to record something. Uh, in those days, he was wanting me to record stuff, and so I went over with a very heavy heart. I didn't know. I said on the video, I don't even know if he kept the video, or whatever. And I said on the video, I don't know what it is, but I feel a very heavy heart. Something's going to happen. And it's going to be heavy. It's when did be, that happen? Uh, September the 10th, 2001. Okay. In Berryville, Arkansas. And actually toward, Eureka, toward Green Forest. But anyway, um, I so when I went into Walmart, when all that was going on, I was not surprised, to be real honest with you. But saying that to say, I didn't want to focus on the fact, I didn't want to focus on 9-11 tonight. I wanted to focus on what has happened since then to try to get the picture that I really feel like the Lord is sending us some warnings, a heads up, wake up time. Yes. And now I'm preaching, I understand I'm totally preaching to the choir here, but I'm also on Facebook Live. And that's what I was originally going to do. I was going to get on Facebook Live, not talk to you guys. I was going to get on Facebook Live. <laughs> oh, no, I mean. Fine. Fine. Boy, I tell you what, you're awake enough to pick on me. Yeah, I'm but, <laughs> I figured you would, you know, you'd get on there and say, okay, Ron's talking again. But, but I was going to get on there and talk to yeah, other right. folks, you know, maybe, perhaps, maybe not the choir that I'm preaching to and say, hey. If you're still having trouble wake up, it's time to come fully awake and leave naivety behind. Yes. So anyway, so that's that was what I was feeling. That's in and, and I was also feeling this clear up rapture, you know. Nice Latin word that is in the Latin Vulgate. Folks used to come to me and say, Ron, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, it is in the Latin Vulgate. That's why, you know, once upon a time we were all basing everything off Latin. It's a Latin word, it means a thief. But it comes like a thief in the night. So we 
you know, that's where we get that lingo. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be all rapture, rapture, rapture. I'm just trying to say as a whole, I want to present something whole that says we need to wake up. We need to humble ourselves, seek his face. Shucks, we used to have a president who would say this, as well as a Baptist preacher that was really popular. Those Arise days, and shine. Those days are long gone. So it's time for us to take personal responsibility, not rely on a president or a, or a very popular Baptist preacher to say it, but say to our individual selves, let's humble ourselves, fall on our face and seek his face and pray. Re- you know, repent from our wicked ways and he will forgive. Okay. I will stop repeating myself. Would you like to? Okay. Sorry, Grace. I know. Thank you. Sir Brian. Thank you, sir. Lord, thank you for the words that were spoken tonight and the the message that that you gave to Ron to pass along to us and his words. Uh, Thank you for the reminders that we've been made aware of and where we win so that we can look forward to where we're going. Help us to keep our eyes open and, and see these things as as they happen, not just uh, in the context of the world, but in the context of your plan and your kingdom coming um, and and the return of of your son, Lord, so that we can stay awake and and be watching for the bridegroom uh, so that we don't we don't miss something that we we're not found asleep, that we are found busy at your work. Whenever you come back, we may never know the exact time until it happens. But we pray that you will keep us on our toes, keep us awake, alert, and focused on your work. Um, because things are obviously moving in the universe, as well as in the world of man, that that are, are ominous in many ways. And we know that this is all incorporated in your plan. Nothing surprises you, Lord. And so help us to see that and see your hand moving in all of these things and use us in your plan so that we can be busy in your fields, uh, sowing and and reaping uh, on your behalf, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I remember also this morning, part of what I was going to say is make the gospel crystal clear. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for joining us and shalom.